Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ivan Turok, and I, I, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar organized by the Regional Studies Association. It's one of five webinars being held over the next two weeks. The details of the other four are on the website. This one is organized by the editors of the Regional Studies Association's new journal called Area Development and Policy. I hope it's a journal that you read, that you enjoy reading, and that you consider publishing or will consider publishing your work in. The topic of today's webinar is the contribution of coalitions and alliances to urban transformation. This is an extremely important subject. For example, the pandemic has shown the problems that arise when governments act unilaterally without engaging with civil society. Also, when they act from the center without much involvement of local government. It's particularly topical here in South Africa, where I am, with uh, local government elections uh, underway today, which are raising serious questions about the capacity of local government in South Africa and about the responsiveness of our dominant political party to the crisis that we face in our cities and communities. It's also a bit of a relief, to be honest, that the webinar is being, or the elections are being held today to coincide with the webinar, because we've been promised that there'll be no power cuts, cuts which will save me embarrassment. So we're going to start the webinar with a lecture from Professor Diana Mittland who is the Professor of Global Urbanism in the Global Development Institute at the University of Manchester. She was the Managing Director of this Institute between 2015 and 2019. Since 2020, she's been the CEO of a major research program called the African Cities Research Consortium. She is also the principal researcher, a principal researcher at the International Institute for Environment and Development, and the Editor-in-Chief of Environment and Urbanization, a very popular journal in our field. Her research focuses on urban poverty and inequality and responses by social movements and state agency to poverty and inequality. Diana is going to talk for about 40 minutes or so. We'll then have short inputs from two discussants. The first one is Professor Lalitha Kamas, from the Center for Urban Policy and Governance at the Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai, India. Lalitha is an urbanist whose research focuses on urbanization, local governance, planning, and urban politics. She's involved in a, a range of academic and practitioner networks in India and the global south more broadly. Our second discussant will be Professor Sue Parnell from the School of Geography at the University of Bristol in the UK, who was previously at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, where she was one of the founders of the African Center for Cities. Sue's research focuses on urban policy and politics, particularly around the sustainable development goals in recent years. So the session will be recorded and please use the Q&A box for any questions you have. Use the chat, please, to introduce yourself to our fellow participants this afternoon. So without further ado, it's over to you, Diana. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you so much. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. Uh, just to say it is, of course, a great honor to be launching this um, webinar series. And I'm deeply appreciative of the Regional Studies Association for reaching out to me. Um, let me, so as Ivan explained, I'm going to talk about coalitions and alliances and trying to understand their contribution to urban transformation. We all recognize, I think, that the need for transformation has, has been longstanding and is particularly acute. Um, I then made reference to the area journal and I was struck by Jeff Paler's recent article when he argued that he was interested in uncovering the politics of sustainable urban development, understanding the conditions around which sustainable development outcomes can be achieved. And of course, that need is particularly acute now as the COP26 is launched. One of the other reasons why it's particularly um, 
important to me to understand this better is, as Ivan also says, I'm honored to lead the FCDO funded research program, the African Cities Research Consortium. So ACRC, as we call ourselves, has been tasked to understand better how to trigger progressive urban change, an urban change that is concerned with uh, securing urban prosperity, reducing urban poverty, and doing both those things at this moment with the climate emergency. So three, three challenging processes. I'm very struck also that to do that will require both leading academic knowledge, new academic knowledge, but also the way in which we place that knowledge in the, in, in the urban arena, in a place where many agencies and actors have been trying for decades to advance this. So reflecting on how we can do this, reflecting on really understand a theory of change that is likely to maximize our contribution to, to urban transformation, led me to reflect more deeply on urban reform coalitions. And that's what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Now, I, in order to do that, I'm going to look inevitably briefly at four bodies of literature. And then I'm going to look at three diverse examples of urban reform coalitions that I've worked with over the last 25 years or so. Um, and I'm going to, to use that as the basis to reflect on why coalitions have worked, what is driving that process. So this is a very brief overview to the four bodies of literature that I hope to draw on. Firstly, on regime theory, probably not on growth coalitions in this presentation, but certainly on growth coalitions as I develop the paper from this presentation. Secondly, on traditions of collaborative planning. Thirdly, on, a, on traditions of relational poverty that might be a little bit new for, for, for academics and others who thought much more about urban politics and urban planning. And finally, on my own work around civil society and civil society groupings that have come together to secure transformation, be it urban or otherwise. So really beginning this reflection on regime theory, um, regime theory is fascinating to me because it really recognizes that urban politics and urban political economy is not, is not is, is perhaps less about winning elections. Winning elections is important, but much more than winning elections is the kinds of ways in which groups, powerful groups come together and agree deals that they then go forth and realize. Regime theory seems from my reading to have been intended to better understand how to secure an urban transformation but it has become a way of understanding how elites, business elites, as well as political elites, come together to determine a path, an urban trajectory that enables them to realize their interests. As, we, as I touch on in this slide, some of that is around growth, growth coalitions, but much of it is, is a much cruder kind of politics. What, what I think is important to me in understanding the ways in which regimes come together, the ways in which business and interests and politicians create an insider group that drives a particular pattern of urban development, one which, which might secure urban prosperity, but rarely addresses urban poverty, is their recognition that institutions and ideas are important. Institutions as ways of, of, of social practices, rules and norms of behavior. And in a very significant way, my reading of regime theory overlaps with one of the bodies of literature that we are drawing on in the African Cities Research Consortium, that of political settlements. Political settlements theory has developed to understand how political authority is put in place, to understand how governments manage to create a monopoly over violence, and also what is the significance of different kinds of political authority for determining patterns of development that subsequently follow? So in drawing on that work on political settlements and drawing on this body of work of regime theory, I think we can recognize the importance of interests and the patterns of behavior that interests set in place, the ways in which they structure the urban context. 
there has been a small body of work within political settlements, drawing particularly on the work of some of my colleagues at Manchester, who led the Effective States and Inclusive Development, thinking particularly of Professor San Hickey, who's also involved in our African cities research. Much of it has not involved coalitions, be they informal or formal, and it's not so much involved territory, which for me is a major, a major um, advantage of presenting this lecture to this audience, and I'll come back to that. But there was one body of uh, work that was done at looking at how change has been put in place in Latin America, um, Berdigue and his co-authors drew on uh, 19 or so configurations of power in 11 countries. And they really recognized that deliberate action by regimes or coalitions can indeed lead to change. And that the nature of those coalitions influences the kind of change, but also the possibilities are deeply embedded in the structural, uh, the structural structuring of power and economic advantage. Their conclusion was that territorial powers, territorial policies matter, as well as sectoral policies. And we'll come back to that. A second body of work that really seems very critical to think about is one that looks at a much more deliberate bringing together of coalitions. The work of collaborative planning, of Habermas and the importance of dialogue and engagement to think about how multiple stakeholders can create this consensus create a consensus that, um, that, that influences, that catalyzes a more pro-poor political will, a more inclusive political process. And I've been, I've, been, I've been struck very much by your own work, understanding how regeneration is taking place in South African cities and the coalitions that local authorities have brought together. So we see in collaborative planning, a real attempt on the part of planning authorities but also others more generally concerned with planning to think about how to catalyze change. Once more, understanding territory, understanding space is important in that process, but not just understanding space and the way in which authorities govern over, over cities, sub-cities, uh, neighborhoods, and the, sub and the city level. Also thinking about time as a further dimension. And Frick analyzes its tactical coalitions within this tradition of, of collaborative planning and really differentiates between those that are ephemeral, those that are emergent, and those that are established. The three examples I'm going to look at are all super well established coalitions. But this tradition is important because it emphasizes to us that efforts to create groupings, new alliances that change trajectories of policies and programming in cities uh, occur all the time. They are repeated efforts, not all of which consolidate into established coalitions and alliances. Moving on to this third body of literature. The third body of literature I think it's useful to reflect on is the literature that looks at relational poverty. Now this is relatively recent, um, perhaps in the last 10 years, although, of course, it has a much longer standing tradition. The, the, the new wave of relational poverty literature is really important because it emphasizes to us that poverty should, the solutions to poverty should not be seen simply as income transfers and or as the creation of new opportunities for education, training, increases in productivity. It recognizes that the structuring of economic relations under capitalism disadvantage some communities, even as they advantaged others. And it really challenges us to think in a context in which modern capitalism is repeating and recreating itself, what then can, can and should we do if we wish to address poverty, address inequality, address the inequities that are being repeated as urban cities are, are as, as urban centers take shape uh, and, and reform. Um, there's a lovely paper by David Moss, which is 11 years old now, and he, he, he elaborates on this need to think about poverty relation, relationally. And also in terms of trajectories of change in the global south, he also emphasizes the ways in which these informal relationships 
which a few slides earlier were benefiting well-established interests in regime, regime theory, disadvantage certain groups, disadvantage those who have low incomes or who are discriminated against in other contexts because informality becomes a path to marginalize and not to include. And he talks a little bit about the clientelist relationships, which are so ubiquitous in towns and cities of the global South. The fourth set of literature really is almost too varied to be a literature, a body of literature itself. And it's the way in which civil society organizations uh, make this strategic alliance making. They, they go out to form alliances in order to strengthen their positions. And there is a wide range of literature that talks about different kinds of alliances that civil society organizations make. So one of the ones, um, one of the, the kinds of, yeah, one of the bodies of literature, again, going back some time, David Corton's work on NGO generations and the ways in which NGOs recognize the importances of alliances with social movement to create transformative change, ways in which NGOs and social movements in different countries create transnational alliances, ways in which civil society organizations seek to engage with um, reformists within the state to strengthen the work of the civil society organizations, but also to strengthen the possibilities of pro-poor state action. There's a lovely recent example, I think, in Aija, Sami's work, which looks at the ways in which a group of low-income um, farmers on the edge of Pune were able to come together and change the nature of urban land and create opportunities for themselves as the city expanded into land they owned. And Sami makes the particular point that in a context in which um, urban power may not be well established, there is a particular potential for what she calls ad hoc coalitions, for coalitions to come together among groups who are less powerful in order to stake their claim on change. A significant body of work within this tradition is the links between academia and civil society organizations. There's a body of work that discusses this in Latin America, or Latin America perhaps less elsewhere, but for a group like Af the African Cities Research Consortium, where not all, but a significant minority of consortium members are academics, we are really thinking about how academic knowledge can support a process of social transformation. Ivan talked in his introduction about the present context, about the COVID, the post-COVID-19 context. And again, there's an important contribution, I think, from this recent paper by Abers et al, in which they look at the ways in which social movements have attempted to create an alliance with the state in both Argentina and Brazil. And they argue that they're very big differences, as I think we, we would all concur, looking at what's happening in those countries, between the policy trajectories that are taking place. These authors argue that way in which social movements can enter into those coalitions, it's influenced not just by the relationships that they are able to form, but once more by the ideas, by the idea of how do you address COVID? What should you prioritize? Should you give an emphasis to the health, um, the economic issues or to the health issues or indeed to social justice issues? So drawing on these four bodies of literature, I use them as a filter to reflect on work of three civil society alliances, formal coalitions in every case that I have been engaged with um, in one case, probably for about five years, because it's only been in place for five years, in the other two, in both cases, for about two decades. I, and in terms of a tradition, it's a methodological tradition. It's closely aligned to the work of political ethnographers. So I have sat alongside these movements, the academics working with them, the NGOs working with them, and I've been able to learn from those discussions. In some cases, I have previously been actively involved in trying to think through what are the lessons of these processes. I would just emphasize that the, the, the point of this analysis is not to assess the value of the approaches, rather it's to understand what they have been able to achieve and how they've been able to achieve it. 
Um, they're all three, maybe I'm going to send, say a little bit about all three before I go in to look at each of them in some depth and then say what I've learned from this reflection. So they're all three combined state and non-state actors. None of them are fully embedded in the state. You can argue that two of them are quite close to the state, the third is not. In all of them, grassroots organizations, social movements arguably of some kind are very much an active part of the coalition making choices on their own on their own grounds. They're all coalitions that have had that have all in some sense absolutely sought to improve material conditions. They have sought to reduce poverty and reduce um, social inequities. They've all sought to reduce political exclusion to ensure that groups that are not part of the elites making choices are, are able to influence those elites. And they are all in some sense playing around with what I call multi-scalar governance. They are trying to ensure that government is more sensitive to local dynamics. But they're also different. So uh, the Urban Resource Center, the first one, is city-based and city-scale in Karachi. Uh, the second one, which is um, a kind of flit between a national program and a city program, CODI, the Community Organization Development Institute in Thailand works at the national scale to catalyze change at the city level, working through city development committees. And the final one is the Makuru Special Planning Area in Nairobi, which is the most recent, which began, um, I mean, arguably 2016, 2017. You could say it began through a research program that predated that, started in 2014, and it's subsidy. It's dealing with a district of about 100,000. So the Urban Resource Center in Karachi, Pakistan, I would say has really been very influential across a wide range of urban thinkers who've looked at the experience to better understand how to create agencies that can nurture urban change. It was itself set up as a consequence of efforts by the Orangi Pilot Project to support substantive change in Karachi that would be pro-poor. So the Orangi Pilot Project emerged, um, was set up to try and address urban poverty in Orangi. Uh, Akhti Hamid Khan, after a process of observation focused on sanitation, other activities grew from that. But OPP's own observations were that it was limited in what it could do. It couldn't, um, it, it couldn't intervene in politics in quite the way it wanted to. So it nurtured this other agency, the Urban Resource Center. As a summary of what the Urban Resource Center sought to do, I've included a couple of diagrams from my colleagues in the Asian Coalition of Housing Rights, which demonstrate how the Urban Resource Center recognized that politicians and planners were separate from the people, the diagram on the left-hand side, and it sought to draw them together as the diagram, diagram on the right-hand side. So what did it do? Um, so it provided a convening space, I, I would say, in its, in its most simplest form. It was an agency, it is an agency, had staff, it had funded projects, it focused a lot, perhaps, for them, of all the three examples I'm, I'm going to refer to, it focused most heavily on using knowledge to drive a change process. So it would do research projects, very empirically grounded research projects. It did one around mass transit. It did another actually that I was also involved in around bus transit um, and the possibility of improving buses. It did one around the Liari Expressway and its potential eviction of 125,000 people. It did one around hawkers in one of the areas in Karachi. It also was doing work to challenge the operation of a land mafia that was trying to uh, consolidate power on the periphery of the city. So it used that knowledge to bring together interested parties, be them uh, officials, politicians, planners, judges, ac other academics, etc. And it drew together community organizations who maybe knew each other, but were not prior to this convening role of URC coming together to strategize. What are the constraints that it faced? I think looking recently at some of the work of Arif Hassan, who's, who's been um, 
supportive of and contributed to the URC for many decades. Arif concludes that the state is now ignoring the protests from communities who are forced to use NGOs and political parties as a go-between. So, and he argues that it's the lack of democracy in Pakistan and particularly the lack of democracy at a local government level that is constraining the role of the URC. So the second example I wanted to look at is the Community Organization Development Institute in Thailand. This has become a, a reference point for countries in both Africa and Asia who have sought government support around informal settlement upgrading. Right from the beginning, Cody was set up as a parastatal, it's stepped slightly further outside of government at this point, but it was set up with multi-stakeholder co committees. It has a strong process to organize local groups through savings and then to network the savings groups to give them strength at the city and at the regional and at the national level in Thailand. But for its work at the city level, it really invested very heavily in drawing together those networks of savings groups with representatives from local authorities, NGOs that are active at the city scale, so local NGOs, academics, professional agencies, other people who were movers and shakers in the city. And it drew together those groups to be able to catalyze change. Its bigger agenda, you can argue, was that um, was, was the quote I summarized here, that a major problem facing Asia is the centralization of power. And there are few opportunities for citizens to be involved. So Cody sought to nurture opportunities for citizens to be involved. I might come back to the quote at the end of this page if I have time. So the city committees, it really saw as critical to catalyzing change. The city committees drew together different groups across the city in, it, their, in their engagement with the local authority. They were able to challenge, for example, the lack of land. They were able to argue the importance of upgrading in situ, not being relocated. One perhaps of the most fascinating examples are, is, a, is a city, Napco and Sawan, which is seen by Cody and others as successful in supporting citywide upgrading. Now it's fascinating because it argues that the, the key to this success has been a mayor who's not related to existing powerful blocks in the city. Might be a business interest, is a business interest in this case, but not linked into existing political parties. This resonates with some of the other experiences from Latin America that I didn't have time to share with you, but perhaps we could talk about in the questions. So the Cody model absolutely has challenges, challenges to ensure the most disadvantaged are included in the upgrading process. But the city committees as a way of rationalizing access to land and city resources and ensuring city support for the efforts of low income groups has proved successful to what they're trying to do. The complexity of the relationships is kind of summarized in this diagram, which also illustrates on the right hand side the ways in which community groups are strengthened to be autonomous. And I'll come back to that issue of autonomy because it seems to be important to understanding why these coalitions and alliances are successful. On the left-hand side, you see the city development committee, all these different groups that are active in this particular city. And it, it, it really, I think the slide gives you a bit of a flavor for the richness of the coalition and alliance building process. So the final example I just wanted to share with you, I could have picked others, but these seemed to me when I was thinking about how to nurture an understanding of catalyzing and supporting transformative urban change. These three seemed particularly rich in the present moment. So the final example is from Kenya, Nairobi, uh, the Mungano Alliance, the Kenyan affiliate of Slum Shackwellers International, this transnational movement of federations of groups living in informal settlements. Mungano Alliance involves three groups, Mungano Warawana Vijiji, the grassroots organization, Yakiba Mashinani Trust, which is a loan fund, and SDI Kenya, which is the NGO. So this work grew out of a study that documented the disadvantage in Makuru. The Alliance had worked on public land up to that point and was, was a, had advanced strategies for securing upgrading on public land, but they were very conscious they didn't know so much that they didn't have a model to do upgrading on private land. After presenting this body of research, they persuaded 
Nairobi County to agree that Makuru should be a special planning area. So two, two year planning process started in August 2017. And they drew together 41 groups to have a very complicated process. It, it was required to be complicated because the process was led by Nairobi County, supported by these 41 agencies. So the Makuru Special Planning Area involved these eight planning consortium, seven with distinct responsibilities, one to draw it all together. It also involved resonating with the work, the, the, the slide that you saw that summarized the CODI process in this city. It also involved work to organize and strengthen organizations of residents to be able to ensure that they also took part in the process. So the Makuru Special Planning Area had a two-year process. It worked to put in place a participatory plan, nurtured very much by provision for participation that was included in the 2010 constitution, the new constitution in Kenya. So it used the potential of the constitution and the requirements of the plan to make a participatory plan, which it then presented to Nairobi County. And somewhat unusually, the COVID-19 process has supported the provision of services in Mukuru. There have been a number of services which have been put in by the Nairobi Metropolitan Service Agency. So that's the example of Mukuru that I just wanted to highlight. Uh, so some constraints on this process. It was uneven because it was very bottom up. It involved different agencies coming together. Not all 41 participated in all of those eight planning uh, groups. Generally, four or five participated in each one. So it was uneven. Uh, the resources, in some ways, the alliance was created to fill resource gaps. And there were also shifts in Nairobi County's political orientation, staff change, which goes back perhaps to the, 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 the challenge that Arif Hassan recognized was facing the Urban Resource Center, that the political context is not always favorable these coalitions and alliances have to continue. So in my last 10 minutes or so, I wanted to just reflect on what I would what I observe around using this literature to, to add insights to what is going on in these three broadly successful coalition efforts to create new, uh, 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 to create a more equitable, um, progressive city. So they are all in some sense posi positioned alongside the state. I put here outside, but closely aligned. I think some you might say are not very outside, but they're not wholly embedded in the state. They have some measure of independence, definitely. In this sense, in this sense they're potentially closer to the debates around an urban regime. They're absolutely not part of a ruling coalition. They're also part informal, part formal. So I've talked quite a bit about formal activities, but the formal activities are nested within almost a continuous and ongoing set of informal engagements, which of course are encouraged because of the formal relationships which are built. So much easier to go to a government official that you've already met who knows you to begin to talk through a problem that you face. The formal engagements provide this explicit space for deliberation and collaboration. Um, so that is also very significant. And I think for me, there's also something about the, re the, the, the relational poverty literature. Without wanting to exaggerate the changes that coalitions and alliances can create, the ways in which relational poverty exacerbates the challenges faced by low-income groups is really quite extraordinary. The ways in which income has become a means to deny people access to the kinds of opportunities and the kinds of, uh, and the voice which is given to more powerful groups is really quite extraordinary. So the ways in which coalitions and alliances, the kinds of engagement that groups get because they begin to relate differently to powerful groups, seems to change the way that exclusion is taking place. They are less excluded, be it the fact that the, the um, government in Karachi and Sindh, the province, gave up the Liari Expressway because of the lobbying went on. That seems to be important. 
the ways in which the residents and the crew have been able to get some access, not adequate access, but some access to services because of the special planning area seems to be important. Some of this work is just about managing informality, not just political informality, but for example, service informality. The, the ways in which the Makuru research demonstrated how much people were paying for services, legitimated by the coalition and the voices, the professional voices alongside that, that coalition activity, the Nairobi County began to see the payments for what they saw as illegal services as an opportunity and not a threat. But really, one of the other things that comes through as critical is the quality of democracy, that these coalitions and alliances in a very real sense depend on democracy to amplify their voice and to legitimate the work they do. They are legitimated by and contribute to legitimating democracy. So the second set of conclusions really relate to this whole idea of legitimacy and the ways in which alliances form in part because of uh, the legitimacy they get is more than simply the sum of their parts. For professional organizations, academics like myself, NGOs, aligning to people's organizations makes them seem less, you know, it's not so much the voice of an expert who might be challenged in the modern world as an expert, not so much the voice of someone who, who, who is using knowledge to challenge politicians who claim representative democracy gives them a legitimacy. Large scale grassroots organizations have a legitimacy because they are the voice of the people who elect the politicians. So part of the, the professional actors in alliances gain legitimacy from this process. The grassroots organizations also gain legitimacy because they find it, they find that they are, they are less likely to be badged as a, as a mob, uh, as, a, as a rebellious uh, group. They are seen as at least cooperating in some sense. So there is a real way in which legitimacy adds value to the voice of these groups. The, the creation of a platform that enables them to share what is going on is also seems to me to be important because it reduces the extent of private deal making. Some of those deal makings may not be so different from the deals that emerge through these platforms. They're all dealing in some sense with the same quality of formal and informal uh, opportunities and flaws and challenges around, for example, service delivery. But risk is reduced because things can be shared informally perhaps, and then formally because information can be tabled. And for the grassroots organizations, they are able to understand what deals are being offered to different organizations and table those deals for everyone to benefit from them or to strategize against them. There's also a real sense in which because groups work together and create these alliances, groups have part of their agenda addressed by their alliances, but there seems to be an element where their autonomy is protected. They can stand back, they can say to the alliance, we're struggling to get our members to agree to that, or we're struggling to bring, on, bring other groups that we work with, other academics, for example, to that position. So it's a way of managing their autonomy alongside recognizing their interdependency with others. The knowledge element is also something that comes through these, um, the different ways in which these groups work together. So the knowledge that the groups that work with CODI at the city scale bring to the table is important the ways in which um, new designs for doing upgrading may reduce the costs below which city authorities think it's going to cost them. That might be communities working to get, to get reduced inputs. So for example, things that community members may choose to do themselves. It may also be technical expertise that finds newer ways of construction, newer ways of installing services. Those, that knowledge can be important to creating new possibilities. The knowledge that catalyzed the McCrew special planning area was an understanding of the amounts of finance that communities were already paying for informal services. 
that helped to create a momentum for change. Another example, which draws on one of the partner organizations to Kenya um, referenced in the Burra, uh, included in the Burra reference, which talks about Pune, was the knowledge that government gained through its engagement with one of these coalitions because it understood what lower level bureaucrats were doing and it could begin to put in place more consistent policy and programming initiatives across its territory. So knowledge is definitely part of the mix. So the ability to move across territory is also part of the work that these coalitions do. And that relates to the fact that they link at the city scale, but the actors in coalitions are active at multiple scales. They might be active in the lowest, the, the, the smallest district or ward, as in social movements, and connect up through. It might be they include NGOs who are working in different parts of the city, who understand the constraints that exist, for example, in, in parts of the city that's very prone to flooding, as opposed to those that are not prone to flooding. In a context in which states struggle to govern territory, this ability of coalitions not just to sit at the city scale, but to represent and have an alternative voice on the way which government is happening across the city seems to be important. So as I put here in the fourth bullet point, some of these are about a weak state. No? Some of these are about the fact that states are not strong enough to govern across their territory. But some also reflect the fact that even if states can govern across the territory, the costs of a of an authoritarian governance are very high. In Makuru, the communities chose to use what they call this 10 cell unit, which is established as a way of, for communities to self-manage some activities in urban governments across East Africa. I came across it 20 years ago, looking at, at ways in which communities in Dar es Salaam were working to provide themselves with security, for example. So finding ways in which communities can self-govern but which are connected up through the city scale so that the advantages of a devolved governance can be maximized and the disadvantages minimized. So they are important, it seems to me, in looking at these examples in understanding how governance can be devolved effectively and strengthen communities' ability to self-act in ways that don't uh, exacerbate their disadvantage and their isolation. So finally, uh, final slide, there seem to me to be some overarching themes. So as I think I've made clear in the earlier literature, this, this tendency for groups and cities to create alliances, to create coalitions has long been observed by different bodies of academics, the political scientists in the case of regime theory, planners in the case of collaborative planning, um, social development specialists and arguably uh, political economy analysts in the context of relational poverty and, and a whole body of different disciplines that look at civil society. All of these have recognized the propensity for civil society in its widest definition to come together and form these coalitions, alliances and networks. There are many things that catalyze this process. Some of, in some cases they grow and consolidate in other cases, they are ephemeral. They last maybe to lobby against a particular policy, which is causing a lot of grief, and they disappear. The three groups I've talked about really try very hard. They've all got some element of, I mean, they've all lasted, you know, these three examples I looked at. And they've lasted by, in some sense, potentially, changing material outcomes, securing political inclusion and thinking about this more territorial governance, being active in this. They demonstrate in a way that you can have, perhaps, regimes that are more inclusive, and you can think about how to do collaborative planning in ways that, that, that is not naive, that enables groups to be organized, so they're not abused by bringing into this process. I'm hesitant about saying that these groups are creating structural change. I'm not sure they are but they are potentially creating reforms that can grow and last. And the fact that civil society organizations keep reinventing groups like this suggests to me that as a strategy, it, it has some, in, some contribution to a transformative agenda. <laughs>
albeit modest. Perhaps in the discussion, we can think more around that. As some of the earlier literature recognizes, the antecedent conditions do matter. There is of course real, there's a real need for people to be able to participate in that. Some of the most vulnerable groups participation may be limited and therefore they risk being left outside. There is a political dynamic. It appears in, in a, quite a few of the academic studies previously, and I've made reference to it earlier, that the politicians that are somewhat independent of parties are important when you look at the places that have been able to use coalitions and alliances to best effect. And that has implications for reform efforts going forward. And the importance of solidarity between some of the most disadvantaged groups. Are, is there, for example, a practice in civil society to include those groups or are they at risk of being left out? And I think finally, something really that came through in all three examples was this, the fact that the quality of democracy matters. In Karachi, they were really struggling in the context in which democratic rights were being rolled back. In Mukuru, they really used the new democratic potential of the constitution to best effect in their efforts going forward. So I've finished sharing what I would like to share with you. Uh, hopefully I've catalyzed some thoughts, presented you with some new information, and I look forward very much to the discussion that will follow after the discussions. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Diana, for a fascinating and very rich uh, presentation to us uh, today. Without further ado, let me hand over to our first discussant, Professor Kama. Thank you so much, uh, Ivan. Um, at the outset, uh, I just want to thank uh, the Regional Studies Association uh, for inviting me to speak on this wonderful panel. It's really a privilege to be part of it. Um, I also want to acknowledge at the outset that my, my knowledge and what I talk about today has really been built through interaction with many others, um, colleagues in my center and elsewhere. Um, so it's very much a uh, knowledge built through uh, coalitions and, and experiential learning, uh, as Diana has shared with us. Um, Diana, that was such a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, first off, I really appreciated the topic that you've chosen to speak on today. In a time of increasing polarization, greater nationalism, and all of which consolidate and centralize state control. Today, we focus on the power and possibility of movements grounded in the local, but whose footprint extends far beyond the local. That's something I think uh, wonderful. And can the voices and politics of such plural urbanisms and regionalisms um, emerge as a counter to the politics of divisiveness and majoritarianism that we seem to be surrounded by? Um, coalition workings, I would say, also have a very practical dimension in that uh, there are serious associated dangers for lone organizations who dissent, for those who are working in minority communities, for example. And so this is a very practical, I think, uh, and positive way in which working in networks and in coalitions actually uh, supports and sustains uh, uh, a much longer uh, sort of agenda and uh, working ability on the part of these groups. Mm. The talk was so rich that um, it's difficult in some ways uh, to pick a few things, um, but I've done that because uh, um, I have a short amount of time. So I'm gonna actually focus on three aspects. Um, I want to talk about knowledge. I want to talk about local politics and democracy. And I will draw on some of my own experiences from Indian cities um, in this. So the first is, one, one of the things that I found so useful in the talk is understanding coalitions in processual terms, thinking of trajectories over time, thinking also of the uneven interrupted process, the setbacks, the changes in direction, and very much a process built on experiential learning. And this in fact suggests to me the really great opportunities in thinking more about the relations between practice and knowledge. There are different ways of knowing, different forms of knowledge, including tacit, non-codified, embodied knowledge. All of these make up practices of collaborating, of co-producing and transforming our cities. The knowledge that is built on experience is typically not valued or treated as expertise, um, uh, especially uh, by 
official uh, agencies. Um, and so in this, I want to sort of pose the question here, how do we in fact seek ways to increase the value of such kinds of knowledge for informing policy making and planning? In some sense, to redirect the politics of expertise or to rebalance it such that it is a little bit more favorable to configurations of those um, who put into motion uh, a pro-poor politics um, and interventions geared towards pro-poor groups. The second thing that I want to talk about is that the presentation really brought to, um, brought in a very central way, brought um, uh, to me this idea of repoliticizing the city. And this is in fact, I think, a, a, an area, a topic that many scholars, including myself, have been focused on in recent years. How do we bring back politics into local governance at a time when governance is being reduced to a managerial approach? And I think coalitions, and certainly the ones that Diana outlined, those stories and those coalitions play a very important role in this process. These coalitions practice their agency through interplay with other actors. And generally, um, a politics, they, sorry, they generate a politics that can shift power relations. And in that has transformatory potential. So it calls for the ability of coalitions to identify the multiple scales uh, where and how power is dispersed in the local governance environment or the local governance ecosystem, as I and several of my colleagues call it um, in my center. This idea of a local governance system is a space where one can think of it as a governance space, which is embedded in the space of the local because it has so much impact in the local, but actors, stakes, interests are not confined to the local. So you'll have exactly as I think we've heard, um, you have international players like the World Bank playing a key role in the city of Mumbai, for example. Um, so what is important here, I think, is for coalitions to understand this space, this uh, very dynamic, political space of the governance ecosystem in which they are operating and how power is dispersed here. And I'd like to in fact draw here from a, some work that I did a few years ago. Um, it was a paper written with uh, my colleagues Himanshu Bhutte and Abhinash Madhale and Robin King. It was written for the WRI um, and focused on this idea of how do we think of coalitions in the city of Pune? Have they really contributed to urban transformations? Um, and I'm going to just pick from that to talk about a particular set, a particular coalition focused around solid waste management um, in the municipality of Pune. Um, and this was a very interesting coalition. It comprised a number of organizations, a waste pickers union um, and civil society organization, a coalition of civil society organizations in the city. Um, and this coalition showed very keen knowledge of where policies are made and they organize themselves appropriately. So for example, solid waste management is a domain whose governance and outcomes have been locally determined. So a lot of their efforts were geared towards the Pune Municipal Corporation, which is in, in many ways the central player here. In fact, the state government plays a more supportive regulatory role. Um, but what they did is they in fact weave or sort of wove back and forth between the local in terms of the PMC, the municipal corporation and the state government and sort of played each other off. Um, they used existing state legislation and policies that was supportive um, um, towards their interest and pushed the city corporation when it was sort of um, stalling and lagging and vice versa. They pushed um, based on their own interactions and their own um, um, internal champions within the corporation um, and pioneered, uh, I think, a really special uh, initiative uh, where what they did is the, the, the focus here was really to create a um, union, um, India's in fact first um, self-organized union of waste pickers um, and integrated these, this union into the uh, they sort of formalized it within the system of solid waste management in Pune city. Uh, and in order to do that, they actually um, employed multi-scalar interventions that straddled research, policy, and actual delivery in terms of um, the collection and generation of primary solid waste. Um, so they also drove the collection of and the creation of new national level policies, but they also 
took advantage of existing ones. Um, they worked with international organizations like the ILO to generate new research, talking about the advantages of bringing in uh, informal sector, informal economy workers, such as waste pickers, into the formal system. And to do that, they generated a politics that advantaged poor informal groups. Um, they recognized waste pickers as workers, which was something quite revolutionary. Um, and they created in this politics, they linked labor, the livelihood of poor women waste pickers, the economies of reuse and repair, and the benefit to the environment. So it was an interlinked labor, economies of reuse and repair, and environment kind of uh, focus. Um, in order to integrate um, a waste pickers union um, within a formal system of governance, they realized that the organizational form of a union would be very difficult. Um, and so what they did is, in fact, they created it as a waste pickers cooperative. So the cooperative is called SWATCH, um, and the waste pickers union is called KKPKP, Kagar Skach Patra Kashtakari Panjayat. Um, and so this is a very interesting way in which the, the waste picker cooperative entered into a formal agreement with the Pune Municipal Corporation to integrate waste pickers into the city's solid waste management systems. And this in fact changed relations or attempted to change relations with the PMC, the Municipal Corporation hitherto used to a contractor system for solid waste management. Um, they also changed relations with Pune's citizenry and among its own members. So the, the change was within the sit citizenry, the sense of waste pickers were seen as women with a sack. And now there was this idea that these are service providers with a uniform and a push card. Um, and within the union itself, they, ha they had to change from a much more confrontationist stance with the Pune Municipal Corporation, with the police who often harassed them to actually think in terms of having a contractual relation and providing a service with and for the PMC. Um, so this initiative, in fact, is perennially in danger of being overturned. But I would argue that one of the interesting things this has taught us is that this politics that they have embarked on has been transformatory. The third and final thing that I want to talk about is democracy. And I think Diana made a very important point when she talked about the quality of democracy, um, it being critical in opening a political space that can be used. And in fact, Stephanie Tawala Marewal and Maria Lanzera have argued that urban democracy is the missing link between urban politics and urban policies in South Asian cities. But I would also submit that our democracies as they currently function are deeply unsatisfactory. They are run by uh, a few small groups, uh, elites, uh, and they follow a hugely unsustainable path of urbanization, a hugely um, unequal uh, path um, geared towards real estate development in many cases. Um, so I would actually suggest that one key thing to focus on here is this idea of, or the verb of democratizing, democratizing the systems that make up our democracy and seeing that as a goal. And that's also something that I think several of the coalitions, the examples from the coalitions that Diana, Diana talked about reveals for us. There are, of course, multiple pathways to such democratization. And this is, again, something that we can learn from. I have been involved in Mumbai in the planning process for the city's development plan. Um, this happened in 2011 and spanned, in fact, several years. Um, and this campaign was, again, a huge coalition of different kinds of civil society groups, um, largely focused on uh, integrating or uh, being an intermediary, facilitating a participatory process down to the ward level, using the preparation of the development plan, the city's plan, as an opportunity to do this. This campaign, it was called the Hamara Shehar campaign, our city campaign. It wasn't, it wasn't a formal role as such that the campaign took on for itself as an intermediary, but it's the opening up of the planning process in the city was definitely supported by the city corporation. And so this idea of opening up the idea and practice of spatial planning in Mumbai to different groups in the informal sector, the question that they pose and the challenge that they put in front of themselves, can we have people as planners? And can they be people from different eco informal economies that run the city, but are typically neglected, ignored, evicted, dispossessed, et cetera? So the answer to that question is really 
you know, did they succeed well? Um, I would actually say that only some of these inputs found their way into the new city development plan. But I would also argue that we shouldn't measure success only in terms of these kinds of concrete outcomes, but we should also think in terms of processes and a much longer term trajectory here. There are three important types of outcomes I saw coming out of this. And uh, this also is based on a paper that I wrote with Marina Joseph some years ago, where we argued that uh, the three outcomes, there, there was different sorts of collaborations and networks that formed as a result of this process. Um, the second was um, a lot of different informal economy groups acquired spatial literacy, um, and they actually started understanding how the land use plan worked and trying to reposition their needs within the framework of the development plan. This also meant that they had to align or they strove to align expert-driven planning standards more to local needs. And the third was also the development of alternatives to ways we plan, experiments in creating a people's plan at the neighborhood level. And this, these were initiated in fact by, again, uh, groups from different informal settlements, informal economies. I'm going to actually end here with saying that coalitions as Diana has articulated them seem particularly well suited to our patchwork governance ecosystem in cities of the global south. Uh, multiple agencies, overlapping roles, little accountability and transparency, um, and in many senses, structures that are not monolithic, a state that's not monolithic, um, where in fact you have contradictory um, agendas, different agencies of the state in fact uh, conflicting with each other. So in such a system, these kinds of coalitions actually can be quite powerful, comprised as they are of different elements, um, working in keeping their own independent, unique identities, but working together to serve common goals. Um, however, I can't help but end saying, what are the limits of coalition building? Um, and I'm asking this particularly because increasingly the state is becoming less supportive toward this kind of pro poor politics. Um, certainly from India, I can say that, um, you know, we, I and my colleague Himanshu Burte have theorized this idea of the weak, strong state, where rather than a weak state or a, or a hollowed out state or a flailing state, you'd actually see a state that's simultaneously weak and strong. Um, it's weak in terms of protecting the welfare and interests of poor groups. It's very strong when it comes to real estate development and supporting that, it's very strong when it comes to evictions. So in such a situation, I think uh, I'm left also grappling with this question, what are the limits of coalition building and what are the different kinds of exhaustions that coalition builders um, and people who work in these networks actually have to deal with? Exhaustion of the body, of resources, but also of the imagination. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Lalitha, for those uh, interesting uh, comments and questions. Uh, over to you now, please, Sue. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you both to Diana and Lalitha, and uh, in fact, to regional, the, the Regional Studies Association. Um, I hope you've had a little look at who's in the room, so to speak, um, because I think it's incredibly exciting at a number of levels. Uh, one is that it really is a global community. Um, and, and for me, just sort of a sense of, gosh, wouldn't it be lovely if we were together? And in some senses, we are. Um, but the opportunity to engage in, in a dialogue like this, which we would not be able to do uh, in person. So um, thanks, and uh, thanks for the, the invitation. Um, then I'm going to direct comments at you, but I'm hoping that um, it's not really at you, right? Um, it's the, the basis and the platform for, for us to pick up on some of these points in, in discussion. And I think if you listen carefully to the things I have to say, you'll see a lot of resonance with what Lalitha said, but also some tension. Um, and I think that may be helpful to, to pick up on. Um, I mean, what the paper that we, we've had and the presentation that we've had today is it provides, I think, a, a very useful intellectual genealogy about the ways that coalitions are formed and they work in cities. Um, and, uh, you know, let's not underestimate, we haven't been doing enough of that, um, that gathering together of really quite a rich intellectual and political tradition and stepping back from that um, to sort of say, well, 
you know, what, what can we learn and where are we at and how might we advance? And the, the Dana's view, I think, provides us really with a, a kind of a patchwork which she puts together, which ultimately endorses that Habermasian kind of view on the world, you know, which is sort of, if we talk for long enough, we will eventually find each other and find some way to kind of niche um, in and, and make um, a coalition of a kind that enables us to deal with and resolve uh, the complex nature of, of conflict in cities. Um, and it leads, I think, therefore, to an endorsement, a fairly unambiguous endorsement of the power of citizens, whether they're organized or not, whether they're working directly or, or, or in an organized fashion or not, but, but more so when they are organized and when they are conscious of their power in coalitions to realize change in cities. So, you know, and as I think you said, Lalita, that's a really, at a moment of bleakness, um, of global bleakness, that kind of argument is very compelling. Um, and I think it's also, actually quite a refreshing intellectual argument. In other words, it's not just compelling politically, we can actually achieve something for the most vulnerable, with the most vulnerable, through the most vulnerable in ways that we might not in any other way. But it's also, I think, intellectually very stimulating because what it is, is it's a bit of a counter narrative um, to a very um, pessimistic con uh, focus on, uh, a critical analysis always on, on the dissection and the deconstruction of lines of oppression and the continuity of that. So it's, it, it is a quite an important shift, I think, in an opportunity to think differently as well as to act differently. And the fact that the person who's been saying that is somebody who is being at the forefront. Um, and for those of you who don't know Diana or her work, both her academic work, but also her political work. I think the argument being made by somebody who has been at the vanguard of scaling up civil society and ensuring that coalitions of the urban poor are visible and legible um, is particularly uh, important. And I think those little cameos that you give and in your cases are a very small part of a, a much wider kind of grounded intellectual and political practice. So for me, that's just, you know, it's really, this is a very significant kind of um, set of reflections. And, and I do have some concerns though, and three very high level concerns that I think we might want to come back to. And then I've got some, what we might think of as more niggly points, both in the affirmative and in, in, in the, the critical voice. I mean, I think it's very important, first of all, conceptually, that when we think about coalitions, we, we, it's useful to think about coalitions of the poor, but surely the way that coalitions work, works for other constituencies as well as uh, those of the poor. So in other words, if there's a generalizable understanding of the nature of the coalition in urban space, it is, is one uh, which must be more general. Um, secondly, is the point that Lelita raised, which I think for me is really important, which is about understanding the limits of the coalition, either because coalitions don't always work optimally, um, but or there, is, there are limits to what coalitions can achieve in cities. In other words, is there something about the urban context and frame that's important for us to be, to be contem contemplating? Uh, and then finally, I'm reminded um, of my dear friend, Vanessa Watson, um, uh, point in paper, which many of you will be familiar with on, on conflicting rationalities and the idea, in fact, that there may be just some very absolute limits and, and philosophical limits to what can be achieved uh, through coalitions. So I think lots for us to chew on, but the strategic question that we've got before us today is Assuming that we think that coalitions really are the best way to engage in questions of urban politics, what then and how do we best use coalitions and how do the poor best use coalitions in order uh, to advance their interests in cities? There are lots of things I really liked. Um, and I'm gonna start with points that I, I think are, are very powerful in the paper um, and are points that are really, really well made. And the first and perhaps the most important one is that what it does is that it puts the focus on politics, okay, unambiguously. You can't think about cities. It takes cities 
and I'm not somebody who believes in the difference between the, and you'll see that in comments to come, between the technical and the political. The technical is political and the political is technical. And I think that by refocusing on the question of politics and coalitions, what we begin to see is the way that different constituencies are either affected by or utilize the technical dimensions of city government. And that takes us directly to the role of the state. And, and I really appreciate it. I think it's an inadvertent and unintended consequence, if you like, of your, your, your wider work and of this paper that in the process of making the case for coalitions of the urban poor, we also learn quite a lot about how governments work, particularly in cities of the South. Uh, in other words, and, and, and I think that's what you mean by your otherwise um, point out, don't like the way it's framed, but I think this is what you actually mean, which is that actually there are lots of people who understand how cities work. It doesn't take academics to actually be at the forefront um, of learning about them. And I think that point comes through really, really clearly, actually. Um, and so, so I think for me, that's a real strength um, of, of, the, um, of your, your presentation. The second thing I thought was a, a really important strength of this was about the city scale of politics. In other words, um, and, and this is really important even in the coalitions literature and experiences where quite a lot of work is done at the neighborhood scale. Um, in other words, that it is possible for the poor to organize and operate at the city scale, which is a really important site of mediation. Okay, so the political settlement is, is very rarely reached at the neighborhood scale. It is often brokered at the city scale. And I think that that opportunity and the, the argument that uh, these are not just micro coalitions of micro uh, applicable battles is comes through for me very, very uh, well. I also really liked in the paper the way um, that put, came through right in that early framing and um, of, of the different intellectual traditions that you were citing. I thought what was helpful for me, really helpful actually, was that you had both a, a temporally and a spatially flat presentation of the conceptual work. In other words, um, it didn't matter that regime theory is actually now kind of actually dates from a previous century and came out of the global north. It's applicable in a different context and place. Um, and I thought, in other words, we could learn as much from northern generated regime theory and communicative planning, similarly, late 20th century, uh, northern ideas as we can from the work on civil society coalitions, which comes primarily out of, of the global south. And I thought for all of us, that was quite a provocative um, advance um, of simply doing in practice what we often navel gaze on in the inordinate amount uh, in the debates about the southern city. So um, some things that I really found particularly affirming and, and helpful. I, I, I've got some niggles um, as, as well, um, some more important than others. And, um, and I think this is in the spirit of saying, I found a great deal um, of value and, 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 and endorse a lot of what you're saying, comma, but. Um, and I think it's just a comma, but that we might all want to come back um, and talk about later on. In other words, is this all we have to do? What does this have to sit alongside? If we do this well, will that be sufficient? And my first concern, and it's, and I know you personally are deeply aware of it and you try to come back to it at the end, but I do think that the focus on coalitions has it, has the, the, at the same time as it's very good at surfacing the political, has a tendency to deflate the economic. Um, and it seems to me that foregrounding that nexus of the political and the economic is absolutely essential not to lose. And I think, you know, in, in your using drawing on your conceptual framings there, the stuff on civil society coalitions is actually less useful than the stuff on regimes um, and regime theory. And I would go back to that and we may want to rethink how we do that um, and the understanding of who the, the players are um, in those regimes may be very different in different places, but it does seem to me to be most important that we do that. The second thing, um, which I think is, is quite problematic in a lot of the, co uh, um, of the coalition literature is um, 
and I've made the point of saying it's good that you have a temporal scope, which doesn't worry about when theory was formulated. But here I want to make the point about time in a different way and in a more negative way. It seems to me that a lot of the work on political settlements and on coalitions has a tendency to focus on certain points in the political process, particularly on the moments of um, agreement of contestation and consolidation. And what it doesn't do is that it doesn't stay the course and it doesn't hold on for long enough. So, and for me, communicative planning is a really good example of this. If you had a much wider scope and you looked not just at communicative planning uh, and decision-making, but you actually looked at some of the, the much longer patterns of development and control and what gets embedded in the big systems that run cities and way that coalitions engage on an ongoing basis with those things. Those are the places where power is ultimately negotiated over an extended period of time, which is sometimes intergenerational. Um, and so it seems to me that what we really need is, and it's much harder to do, communities and coalitions are typically quite ephemeral in their struggle. And actually sometimes the really important uh, battles to be fought in cities are ones that are hidden institutionally or take place over a much, much longer uh, kind of uh, time frame. And related to that, it seems to me, and um, if the sort of idea of kind of, can we please recalibrate the points around which coalitions converge and the players with whom they seek to engage is that it seems to me that we can't simply talk about states. States are not monolithic. There are lots of elements to states. And what is absolutely fundamental is being able to get into the workings of the, the urban government regime. And why that's particularly important, and any, we all know this because we work with local government, but we forget it. What makes local government different from national government is that you have an administrative and a political process that work in harmony with each other. And your coalition has to be able to engage both arms of that uh, governing regime. So, and the fights between the experts, the so-called experts, whether it's the planner versus the transport engineer versus the, the treasurer may be as important as anything else. And your cases begin to show that, but I don't think that we theorize that. Um, and we certainly don't surface that in our conceptual thinking. Uh, in, in nearly sufficient detail. And so I'd like a bit more um, of that. And similarly, I think one of the problems with coalitions and the speaks to the thing of, of kind of what are the limits to this stuff, you know, is actually, it seems to me that, that coalitions are typically very poor at moving beyond the local state. Um, in other words, we've managed, I think, quite successfully, Diana, not least on the basis of some of your own personal leadership to scale up to the city scale, sometimes even to the national scale but we're really very poor at taking on global capital who are quite often the interests which shape cities um, and foreign interests which shape cities. And so I think not, it's not to say that that's what coalitions have to do, but it is to say, if we are to achieve truly pro-poor cities, we may want to think strategically about other ways of accessing those points of control in significant kinds of ways. And so I just wanted to leave it with you that I think we need to be really careful about making sure that we don't overburden our expectations of coalitions, that we are very mindful of the limits of coalitions, that we are alert to the fact that the politics of coalitions are general, not just the politics of the poor, um, and therefore to think uh, in slightly more um, open kinds of ways about what those transformative processes in cities might be. But to, suggest, to say all that is not for a minute to detract from what I think have been very significant, very material, as, very, as, very, as well as very significant conceptual changes uh, to our understanding, which are brought about by understanding the politics of coalitions and the poor. Thanks. Um, thank you very much, Sue, for those uh, very uh, interesting questions, challenges to Diana. Diana, just because of time constraints, I'm just going to try and sum up, um, I think, what some of the comments in the, uh, the Q&A are saying. 
which kind of chime a little bit with Lalita. So I'm going to just briefly kind of pose that as a question uh, to sort of sharpen, I think, what, what, um, what, what the questions to you really burn down to, come down to. And I think the, the, the message that's coming out is that, um, you know, this sense that this is really positive process of opening up the exercise of power beyond narrow interests to involve a range of other stakeholders, poor communities, academics, and a range of other sectional interests. Question, people asking questions about the ability to sustain these coalitions beyond the specific problems and concerns that often prompt their formation. How to widen the agenda in a way that will deliver real lasting change. Um, and Sue has sort of focused that on the economic, real economic change and change around um, getting state bureaucracies to alter the way they operate beyond the initial decision, the way services are delivered and um, policies are implemented. I think that gets to the heart of, of, of some of the questions to you. So you've got about 10 minutes or so now to handle um, these comments and questions. Uh, over to you, please. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks, Lalitha and Suze, thanks so much. It was, uh, I feel privileged <laughs> to have such comments thrown at me and, and challenged to think about this. I, I mean, and I, I really appreciate the thought that, that has gone into your reflections. Um, I, I would say that I'm anxious that the the benefits of coalitions are not overstated. Um, I think that the world, particularly international development agencies, often look for solutions to things that cannot be solved um, and therefore are not proposing <laughs> coalitions as the next solution. It, it doesn't really help, I think, to think about things in that way. I, I think, you know, really, um, both of you have been long-standing, um, like myself, have kind of have, have, have been academics who've been frustrated by the constraints of academia and reached out and worked in a very collaborative way with other people who are trying to transform urban outcomes. So I, I, I think you've also seen and understood the things that I've observed. I think that you know, both of you touched on the fact that the urban is highly political and the, the, there has been a tendency, I think, in academia to, in, from where I sit, to exaggerate the, the non-political trend in cities. I can't see it myself. Uh, I think there are many people who are trying to recapture the urban agenda, who are fighting against their needs and interests being denied, who are very active. And there are others who are trying to support that process sometimes for self-interested reasons. I think that one of the challenges I find is that we are asked to say whether things succeed or fail, but for me, politics is always in play. Um, there are always people who are challenging and who are being pushed back um, as, as some of the groups I've worked with, activist groups get super frustrated at me when I tell them this, but for me, you only succeed in politics to get to a more difficult level. Um, your reward for success is not that you can retire. It is that rather than fight at the subsidy level to control a district and to advance groups a, a more pro poor trajectory of change at the district level, you get to play at the city level. If you are super successful at the city level, you may be invited to play at the national level, but you are always challenged. And the more successful you are around securing a redistribution of income, then of course, the more likely you are to be challenged by people disadvantaged from that. So Sue, I think your point, the point where you ended up is that we have to take into account economic interests is absolutely important. I think that coalitions may be very skilled. I think, and Lalitha, you gave a lovely example of where they, the, the waste recyclers were able to challenge the way in which the municipality was thinking about waste and understand that through creating worker co-ops, they could think differently about waste management. I think, you know, that for me is an example of where you can promote a win-win, but we cannot be naive. You know, you are not going to transform all cities in all locations 
by identifying win-win agendas. It is simply not possible. I think also I recognize that, that and inevitably 40 minutes is perhaps too short for the, argue, the argument I wish to make, but that I picked successful examples. I could have picked others, but they are many which struggle to go beyond the initial stages. And they struggle for lots of reasons. One of the reasons why they struggle is that some political groups are very hostile to the idea of coalitions forming, especially at the city scale. They feel too challenged by the power that it represents. And they seek to undermine coalitions in all the ways that we would anticipate them undermining it. So by playing really a very crude and dirty politics. So I absolutely agree that it's very difficult to really, especially in the first stages, to start off coalitions and to keep them on, on track. Even the example of Mukuru, which has been successful, was predated really by 20 years of work. And um, the, the, the alliance I talked about, the Mungano Alliance, came together in the mid 90s, but it also drew on a much longer organizing trajectory of those social movements. So the successful coalitions are ones that have stood the test of time. Many don't get to that point. Many struggle to, to recognize that. In my own experience, I think the quality of learning in a coalition becomes very important for its own ability to advance. So, and this perhaps is where um, I, would, I would hope that academic communities can contribute in a very real way, whilst, whilst not uh, occupying all the learning space. Lalita, I didn't spend enough time talking about the importance of tacit, tacit knowledge and, and um, the knowledge that non-academics bring to the process. So I'm not trying to monopolize the learning experience, but anything that helps coalitions understand the way in which they're developing their work, I think is broadly beneficial. There is, of course, and I, I really would emphasize this because I'm concerned, there is a limit to transparency. And some coalitions, indeed, the advantage of coalitions is they can manage what knowledge is placed in the public arena and what knowledge is held back from the public arena. So for me, coalitions, it's, it, you can snapshot coalitions and you will create success at some snapshots and you can take other snapshots and you'll identify failure. But, but coalitions are in a process of change and sometimes they get pushed back and sometimes they advance. And I think we potentially can help better understand the conditions under which they advance while not being naive to the things that they are, are challenged to do. I think one of the, I, Sue, you talk in a, in a sense about how can coalitions go on and think beyond the city. And that to me is something I have, I have not seen many coalitions that are effective beyond the city. I think there is something about an urban politics, something about the relationships which bring people together at the city that is hard to take above the city. And I don't myself understand why. I, I, I've perhaps not reflected on it enough, but I also think my own experience has been primarily at city and sub-city level. So certainly in the African Cities Research Consortium, we are going to try and better understand the potential of cities to engage with national agendas and the ways in which national agendas structure opportunities and constraints for cities. We assume that there is a difference of a political difference. We allow for the potential of a political difference, but absolutely, you know, going back to some of your work, work Sue, we recognize that national urban policies and the informal programming and policies that go beyond the explicit national urban policy is going to be critical. And of course, the international regimes, for want of a better word, the rules around how international trade takes place, how international governance takes place are all critical. Absolutely, we have to understand that better. And cities, be it city coalitions or city politics, city governments have, I think, to understand it better. I, I think, Lalitha, one of your comments really highlighted to me something that is significant about the way in which coalitions are beginning to work. And perhaps the point on which I'd just like to end, Ivan, because I'm I appreciate your responsibilities to draw this to a, to a close. Um, and that is the way in which some coalitions have played an environmental politics. And in playing an environmental politics have opened the possibility of aligning needs and interests of mid middle income and higher middle income groups with the agendas of low income groups. And 
I think the ability to do that is again potential. The, of course, it, it's, there's never any easy answer, no. Coalitions who go down this route have got to struggle to remain relevant to the lowest income groups, whilst at the same time finding ways in which they can strengthen their own power by aligning to the more powerful groups. And you know, you're riding the tiger in, in a very real sense. So I have been struck by the ubiquitous nature of efforts to build networks and coalitions, to ensure that groups are not isolated, to challenge the isolation, which is a means by which particular interests have sought to control urban agendas and urban outcomes. So I've, that's been very notable to me. But at the same time, I absolutely recognize that this is, there is no panacea. There's no easy solution. That we have to think much harder as academic, academic activists about how we contribute, where we contribute, where we hinder learning. And I think um, hopefully this discussion and the debates which is drawn on and the debates which it will contribute to will help to make choices for those participating in the debates, which are better rather than worse in terms of the way in which we understand coalitions and alliances and urban transformation in the 21st century. So let me stop there, Ivan, and pass it back to you. I keep seeing things flying on the chat and the questions that I haven't got time to read. It's very frustrating. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was very, very helpful. And um, I just want to thank you again for a really uh, a fascinating, subtle, thoughtful, um, really based on profound experience and knowledge over many years, clearly. Uh, and also, in, in my view, an optimistic um, sense here, uh, giving us hope, giving us a, a sense of possibility, and indeed inspiring for that reason. So uh, a really uh, enjoyable session. We really look forward to reading the written uh, product that will come out. And we look forward to the, also want to thank the two discussants for, I think, provoking you and drawing out, I think, some of the really important um, uh, lessons learned and also uh, doubts about some of what you had to say. This is, is not, as you said, a panacea. This is not a, a simple solution that uh, any particular international agency can roll out. This, but this does give us grounds for optimism and this does give us lots of food for thought and, and hope in terms of organize, better organizing uh, communities for a better urban future. So uh, without further ado, our time is up. Uh, I'd like to thank all the participants too for your comments and your questions for, I hope you've enjoyed the seminar this afternoon and look forward to your further engagements with the journal and with the Regional Studies Association. So thanks for all your efforts, uh, three uh, uh, speakers and discussants, uh, much appreciated all the effort you put into this afternoon. Bye-bye.